Uh, let's see, you guys, you guys are there, so I'll, I'll stand in the, I'll look in the sun. Okay, so I don't know what happened that last video. Maybe you guys didn't get that last, that last lecture. So sorry, I thought it was recording, but maybe it was, wasn't. So we, did, we just talked about the channel. The last off, we talked about um, Cuyahoga's Creek and functioning and all that kind of good stuff. Um, okay, so uh, here we've walked a little bit farther down and we're at the edge of this one part of the levee. So I want to talk about the levee next. Actually, for, first, first, let's actually do a 360. So let's look. So we have, so we have, um, we have the, the, the creek area here, the Perrin Channel. Then we're on the levee. And then you can see here the floodplain. If you guys just eyeball it here, I think it's really easy to see that even though we're not measuring it, the elevation of the soil surface down there and the elevation of the upper bench here is very similar, right? It's close. So that's why it's a relatively easy place to restore here because we don't need to do a whole lot of, of excavation, etc. You can also see that this is a pretty, pretty heavily vegetated uh, a plain here, right? And so there's lots of good biomass, all that stuff going on. But you can also see, if you look to the left, you can see Arundo starting to come in, right? So we see the Arundo. So this 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 light, uh, lightish, yellowish colored, grassy kind of thing. So that's Arundo invading in. Um, so, okay, okay. Is that uh, owned road? Yes, all this is owned by the university. Well, technically the levee is a county property, but, but it, the, it's on university. Yeah, so we own from the middle of the channel out to the rest of campus okay so um okay yeah so let me just talk real quick about the history of the levee here i'm gonna go like this maybe and see if this continues to record as opposed to what happened last time is it still recording yeah okay okay so um levy levies are important levies need to be maintained and all that all that kind of stuff right just like a lot of this area was out of sight out of mind and if we look here as we go forward, so we're on this, this part of the levee, the levee continues, but it drops down a little bit. Um, but as we look, it's, you know, so this where we're standing is easy to see. You could park out there and look and you'd see it. Once we start going to this area, it gets harder to see the levee, yeah? So um, if you're in an area where there's kids doing the silly kid things and, you know, all that jazz, not, don't have a lot of money to, to manage or maintain it, et cetera, it's going to be more or less ignored. And that's what happens. So when I mentioned that, that, that water year, that 2004, 2005, that, that, that big um, rainy season, um, big flows here. Uh, and if we have time, we'll go over there. We might not have time because I want to be sensitive and, and start talking about cram and stuff. But, but um, kind of a little bit farther over there, part of that heavy flow for whatever reason right ran this was a boulder here not a boulder whatever the water kind of turned this way and it went like this into the levee and it started eroding the levee and it kept eroding the levee and it's continued to erode the levee sent levee since because there's no um important you know infrastructure here there's condor airfields. There's some. There's some uh, ponds from the local water district we can we can talk about. But none of those are in the immediate floodplain. Those are all up on the on more of the terrestrial edge, the higher elevation. So there's nothing right here. There isn't anybody's house. There isn't a. There isn't an orchard, right? So there's nobody here saying, "Oh my gosh, fix this county." And it was in the midst of all of this uh, vegetation and stuff. It just sort of kept getting bigger and kept getting bigger and kept getting bigger. And so that's essentially where we are now. So every time we have a good water year, that, that levee erodes a bit more. So if we do nothing at all, soon, or at some point, the, there's gonna be some connection here, right? So it probably makes sense to go ahead and take down a section of the levee anyways, since it's already on its way to failing. Nobody wants to save it, yeah, man. So the question is, what's stopping CSUCI from knocking it out? I would have to have many, many, many glasses of alcohol to go through the full story of that. <laughs> um, the long story short is we were advocating that. We'll talk about that in a second. But I've been advocating that for a long time. State agencies have been advocating that. We had money. We had $7.1 million uh, uh, lined up for it. And there, there's a whole variety of things. Um, 
want to be careful with how I say this. Um, I would just say the current... Hmm, hmm, uh, not everybody in the administration understands environmental sustainability. I'll say that. And so, so one of the deals... One of the deals with getting so this money that we had coming in. Well, but let me say let me say that. I'll say that when we talk about uh, mitigation banks. So hold that. We'll answer it a little bit. Long story short is uh, political will, lack of political will. Um, I wish there was a better answer, but uh, it's tough. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that I can do. There's a lot of stuff that you guys can do. But when it comes to something doing stuff to the land that the university owns. You and I can't, like, you know, they're the title holder. They have to be, if they're not a willing, you know, if they don't sign the contracts, I, I can do as cons many consultant reports or talk to people and lobby and whatever, but, but I, don't, I don't have the power to tell them to do that, right? Nor should I, I'm just a professor, right? But, um, but it baffles my mind why, they've, why we've not done this so far. And it's, it's um, lack of vision is the short answer. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, uh, uh, yo, yes. I don't, I'm sorry. I don't see which one you're talking about. It's like a, it's a bird of prey right in this willow, I think. Or whatever Very that is there. You might be able to step over here and see it better. I think it, it might be a red tail or uh, oh, a yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, it's either a red tail or red shoulder. I think it's a red tail. Yeah, I think there, there's I think. usually a nest in this area like every year around this time. Yeah, I mean, it's, so interesting. Uh, in the in the um, palm trees here, so th these are not native. These trees, right? So so th we do have a native palm, a little small one that's in a lot of our wetlands, but it's very it's very stumpy, short one. But when we think of Southern California, one of the you know, L.A. Southern California, one thing you think of the iconic palm trees, all imported none of them are native interesting though this th these and these are relatively short but it's, especially our taller palm trees that have this you know the palms are this kind of really like you and i at least i'll speak for myself i look at that i look at that one look at that one i'm like man that's a crappy place to build a nest oh my god the most favorite place of all for barn owls barn owls oh, love wow. those things and i i would think like what that's horrible like rah, rah, rah. But barn owls are so named because, I mean, they're, obviously they were here before we had barns, but, but um, they, they love structure, right? They'll love any kind of structure. As long as they can sort of get up in somewhere and hang out, they're, they're cool. And so obviously they love people's barns and, and roofs with eaves and stuff. But uh, these, these trees are actually really popular places. So both these trees and the, the hay barn out there, the, 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 the three-story hay barn, uh, lots of barn owls up they love that that structure too so um so it's interesting that so that hawk is on is you know in sort of relatively low elevation he's looking for prey but these these areas are where you'll actually get um, a pretty significant raptor population um along the levee here um another another interesting so we're talking about levees i'm, I'm kind of rambling here but um no trees here right there's an oak tree over there there's trees but if you look technically speaking the trees are kind of off right? The Army Corps of Engineers, which is the agency in the U.S. That, that, that does most of our levies, that certifies most of our levies, saying that they're actually working as far as flood protection or whatever they're supposed to do, uh, they basically have a policy of saying no trees on a levy ever. So they have a policy of denuding completely, you know, pesticides, herbicides, kill the hell out of the, out of the vegetation on the levees. One, to kill all the rodents because particularly things like ground squirrels the worry is they, they burrow in and then weaken the structural integrity and then again you know today it won't matter but again designing for that big peak flow they're worried the reason they hate to have trees on most levees is the the, the root ball so you might think about it and like hey if we have more vegetation shouldn't that be helping stabilize the soil reduce erosion under regular conditions yes but under super Santa Ana's, under hurricanes, like those kind of intense conditions, I can have my tree here and if it blows and I fall, my, my root ball gets ripped up. I can really quickly rip up a big chunk out of the, out of the side of the levee and reduce the structural integrity. 
right? So um, that's a whole other conversation, but, but uh, I'll just say that officially you'll see most levees are, are naked because of that, because people are freaked out about animals or freaked out about um, um, trees. And not plants, kind of, but especially trees with large root structures. Okay, so, so, so we have this levee up here that's, that's, that's starting to fail or, or has started to fail, and if done nothing else, it eventually is gonna erode into and, and make the rest of this fail. That's an issue. So we can also propose restoration did it take off? Oh yeah, it took yeah. off. It was actually a harrier, I think. Oh, okay, cool. Got the wing tips facing upward. Cool, cool, cool. cool. Uh, so the other other thing we have to worry about is if this were to fail. So it seems like nobody's repairing that levee, right? Which is good. I'm all for it. Awesome. But if we just have a random failure of this structure, uh, it won't. It wouldn't happen this year. But eventually, it would start to threaten over there eventually if this if all this levee were to come down here that we're standing on so check it out if you look there's a slight bend in the river right here right it's kind of going like this and then it goes like that so that means there's a lot of hydrological force on this side of the channel it can take out that it can theory take out that road that would be bad right so that would be non-desirous so if we in the in a restoration plan what we might want to do is is take down the levee, but then say this segment where we're standing, sort of, you know, make this one a little bit harder, right? You know, like some of the material we dig up from over there, dump it here and make it a bit more reinforced so that we're assured that the engineered structures down there aren't endangered by any, by any flows, right? So that's totally doable, but you must plan for that. And so lack of planning isn't just bad for the ecological functioning, it can be bad for the other services that we get from the systems and the surrounding systems. Okay, there we go. Um, I'll give you guys a minute or two to just meander around and then we'll, we'll walk to another site.